Chapter 3 The Peddler Clusters of pots clattered and banged as the peddler's wagon rumbled over the heavy timbers of the wagon bridge. Still surrounded by a cloud of villagers and farmers come for festival, the peddler reined his horses to a stop in front of the inn. From every direction, people streamed to swell the numbers around the great wagon, its wheels taller than any of the people, with their eyes fastened to the peddler above them on the wagon seat. The man on the wagon was Padan Fain, a pale, skinny fellow with gangly arms and a massive beak of a nose. Fain, always smiling and laughing as if he knew a joke that no one else knew, had driven his wagon and team into Emmons Field every spring for as long as Rand could remember. The door of the inn flew open even as the team halted in a jangle of harness and the village council appeared, led by Master Alvear and Tam. They marched out deliberately, even Sen Bui, amid all the excited shouting of the others for pins or lace or books or a dozen other things. Reluctantly, the crowd parted to let them to the fore, everyone closing in quickly behind and never stopping their calling to the peddler. Most of all, the villagers called for news. In the eyes of the villagers, needles and tea and the like were no more than half the freight in a peddler's wagon. Every bit as important was word of outside, news of the world beyond the two rivers. Some peddlers simply told what they knew, throwing it out in a heap, a pile of rubbish with which they could not be bothered. Others had to have every word dragged out of them, speaking grudgingly with a bad grace. Fane, however, spoke freely, if often teasingly, and spun out the telling, making his show to rival a gleeman. He enjoyed being the center of attention, strutting around like an undersized rooster, with every eye on him. It occurred to Rand that Fane might not be best pleased to find a real gleeman in Emmons Field. The peddler gave the council and villagers alike exactly the same attention as he fussed with tying his reins off just so, which was to say hardly any attention at all. He nodded casually at no one in particular. He smiled without speaking and waved absently to people with whom he was particularly friendly, though his friendliness had always been of a peculiarly distant kind, backslapping without ever getting close. The demands for him to speak grew louder, but Fane waited, fiddling with small tasks about the driver's seat, for the crowd and the anticipation to reach the size he wanted. The council alone kept silent. They maintained the dignity befitting their position, but increasing clouds of pipe smoke rising above their heads showed the effort of it. Rand and Matt edged into the crowd, getting as close to the wagon as they could. Rand would have stopped halfway, but Matt wriggled through the press, pulling Rand behind him until they were right behind the council. I've been thinking you were going to stay out on the farm through the whole festival, Perrin Abara shouted at Rand over the clamor. Half a head shorter than Rand, the curly-haired blacksmith's apprentice was so stocky as to seem a man and a half wide, with arms and shoulders thick enough to rival those of Master Luhan himself. He could easily have pushed through the throng, but that was not his way. He picked his path carefully, offering apologies to people who had only half a mind to notice anything but the peddler. He made the apologies anyway and tried not to jostle anyone as he worked through the crowd to Rand and Matt. Imagine it, he said when he finally reached them. Beltine and a peddler, both together. I'll bet there really are fireworks. You don't know a quarter of it, Matt laughed. Perrin eyed him suspiciously, then looked a question at Rand. It's true, Rand shouted, then gestured at the growing mass of people, all giving voice. Later. I'll explain later. Later, I said. At that moment, Padan Fain stood up on the wagon seat, and the crowd quieted in an instant. Rand's last words exploded into utter silence, catching the peddler with an arm raised dramatically and his mouth open. Everybody turned to stare at Rand. The bony little man on the wagon, prepared to have everyone hanging on his first words, gave Rand a sharp, searching look. Rand's face reddened, and he wished he were Ewan's size, so he did not stand out so clearly. His friends shifted uncomfortably, too. It had only been the year before that Fane had taken notice of them for the first time, acknowledging them as men. Fane did not usually have time for anyone too young to buy a good deal of things off his wagon. Rand hoped he had not been relegated to a child again in the peddler's eyes. With a loud harumph, Fane tugged at his heavy cloak. No, not later, the peddler declaimed, once more throwing up a hand grandly. I will be telling you now. As he spoke, he made broad gestures, casting his words over the crowd. You are thinking you have had troubles in the two rivers, are you? Well, 
All the world has troubles, from the Great Blight south to the Sea of Storms, from the Arith Ocean in the west to the Aeel Waste in the east, and even beyond. The winter was harsher than you've ever seen before, cold enough to gel your blood and crack your bones. Ah, winter was cold and harsh everywhere. In the borderlands, they'd be calling your winter spring. But spring does not come, you say. Wolves have killed your sheep. Perhaps wolves have attacked men? Is that the way of it? Well, now. Spring is late everywhere. There are wolves everywhere, all hungry for any flesh they can sink a tooth into, be it sheep or cow or man. But there are things worse than wolves or winter. There are those who would be glad to have only your little troubles. He paused expectantly. What could be worse than wolves killing sheep and men? Sen Bui demanded. Others muttered in support. Men killing men. The peddler's reply, in portentous tones, brought shocked murmurs that increased as he went on. It is war, I mean. There is war in Gialdan. War and madness. The snows of the Dalin forest are red with the blood of men. Ravens and the cries of ravens fill the air. Armies march to Gildan. Nations, great houses and great men send their soldiers to fight. War. Master Alvir's mouth fit awkwardly around the unfamiliar word. No one in the two rivers had ever had anything to do with a war. Why are they having a war? Thane grinned and ran to the feeling he was mocking the villagers' isolation from the world and their ignorance. The peddler leaned forward as if he were about to impart a secret to the mayor, but his whisper was meant to carry, and did. The standard of the dragon has been raised, and men flock to oppose, and to support. One long gasp left every throat together, and Rand shivered in spite of himself. The dragon? Someone moaned. The dark one's loose in Gildan? Not the Dark One, Aral Luhan growled. The dragon's not the Dark One, and this is a false dragon anyway. Let's hear what Master Fane has to say, the mayor said. But no one would be quieted that easily. People cried out from every side, men and women shouting over one another. Just as bad as the Dark One. The dragon broke the world, didn't he? He started it. He caused the time of madness. You know the prophecies. When the dragon is reborn, your worst nightmares will seem like your fondest dreams. He's just another false dragon. He must be. What difference does that make? You remember the last false dragon? He started a war, too. Thousands died. Isn't that right, Fane? He laid siege to Ilion. It's evil times. No one claiming to be the dragon reborn for 20 years, and now three in the last five years. Evil times. Look at the weather. Rand exchanged looks with Matt and Perrin. Matt's eyes shone with excitement, but Perrin wore a worried frown. Rand could remember every tale he had heard about the men who named themselves the Dragon Reborn, and if they had all proven themselves false dragons by dying or disappearing without fulfilling any of the prophecies, what they had done was bad enough. Whole nations torn by battle and cities and towns put to the torch. The dead fell like autumn leaves, and refugees clogged the roads like sheep in a pen. So the peddlers said, and the merchants, and no one in the two rivers with any sense doubted it. The world would end, so some said, when the real dragon was born again. Stop this, the mayor shouted. Be quiet. Stop working yourselves to a lather out of your own imaginations. Let Master Fane tell us about this false dragon. The people began to quieten. But Sen Bui refused to be silent. Is this a false dragon? The Thatcher asked sourly. Master Alvir blinked as if taken by surprise, then snapped, Don't be an old fool, Sen. But Sen had kindled the crowd again. He can't be the dragon reborn. Light help us. He can't be. You old fool, Bui. You want bad luck, don't you? Be naming the dark one next. You're taken by the dragon, Sen Bui, trying to bring us all harm. Sen looked around defiantly, trying to stare down the glowers, and raised his voice. I didn't hear Fane say this was a false dragon, did you? Use your eyes! Where are the crops that should be knee-high or better? Why is it still winter when spring should be here a month? There were angry shouts for Sen to hold his tongue. I will not be silent. I've no liking for this talk either. 
but I won't hide my head under a basket till a Taran ferryman comes to cut my throat. And I won't dangle on Fane's pleasure, not this time. Speak it out plain, peddler. What have you heard, eh? Is this man a false dragon? If Fane was perturbed by the news he brought, or the upset he had caused, he gave no sign of it. He merely shrugged and laid his skinny finger alongside his nose. As to that, now, who can say until it is over and done? He paused with one of his secretive grins, running his eyes over the crowd as if imagining how they would react and finding it funny. I do know, he said, too casually, that he can wield the one power. The others couldn't, but he can channel. The ground opens beneath his enemy's feet, and strong walls crumble at his shout. Lightning comes when he calls and strikes where he points. That I've heard. And from men, I believe. A stunned silence fell. Rand looked at his friends. Perrin seemed to be seeing things he did not like. But Matt still looked excited. Tam, his face only a little less composed than usual, drew the mayor close. But before he could speak, Ewan Fingar burst out. He'll go mad and die. In the stories, men who channel the power always go mad. And then waste away and die. Only women can touch it. Doesn't he know that? He ducked under a cuff from Master Bully. Enough of that from you, boy. Sen shook a gnarled fist in Ewan's face. Show a proper respect and leave this to your elders. Get away with you. Hold steady, Sen, Tam growled. The boy is just curious. There's no need of this foolishness from you. Act your age, Bran added. And for once remember you're a member of the council. Sen's wrinkled face grew darker with every word from Tam and the mayor, until it was almost purple. You know what kind of women he's talking about. Stop frowning at me, Luhan, and you too, Craw. This is a decent village of decent folk, and it's bad enough to have Fane here talking about false dragons using the power without this dragon-possessed fool of a boy bringing eyes Sedai into it. Some things just shouldn't be talked about, and I don't care if you will be letting that fool Gleeman tell any kind of tale he wants. It isn't right or decent. I never saw or heard or smelled anything that couldn't be talked about, Tam said. But Fane was not finished. The Aes Sedai are already into it, the peddler spoke up. A party of them has ridden south from Tarvalon. Since he can wield the power, none but the Aes Sedai can defeat him. For all the battles they fight, or deal with him once he's defeated. If he is defeated... Someone in the crowd moaned aloud, and even Tam and Bran exchanged uneasy frowns. Huddles of villagers clumped together, and some pulled their cloaks tighter around themselves, though the wind had actually lessened. Of course he'll be defeated, someone shouted. They're always beaten in the end, false dragons. He has to be defeated, doesn't he? What if he isn't? Tam had finally managed to speak quietly into the mayor's ear, and Bran, nodding from time to time and ignoring the hubbub around them, waited until he was finished before raising his own voice. All of you, listen. Be quiet and listen. The shouting died to a murmur again. This goes beyond mere news from outside. It must be discussed by the village council. Master Fane, if you will join us inside the inn, we have questions to ask. A good mug of hot mulled wine would not go far amiss with me just now, the peddler replied with a chuckle. He jumped down from the wagon, dusted his hands on his coat, and cheerfully righted his cloak. Will you be looking after my horses, if you please? I want to hear what he has to say. More than one voice was raised in protest. You can't take him off. My wife sent me to buy pins. That was Whit Conger. He hunched his shoulders at the stares some of the others gave him, but he held his ground. We've a right to ask questions, too. Somebody back in the crowd shouted. Hi. Be silent, the mayor roared producing a startled hush. When the council has asked its questions, Master Fane will be back to tell you all his news, and to sell you his pots and pins. You, Tad, stable Master Fane's horses. Tam and Bran moved in on either side of the peddler, and the rest of the council gathered behind them. And the whole cluster swept into the wine spring inn, firmly shutting the door in the faces of those who tried to crowd inside after them. Pounding on the door brought only a single shout from the mayor. Go home! People milled around in front of the inn, muttering about what the peddler had said, and what it meant, and what questions the council was asking, 
and why they should be allowed to listen and ask questions of their own. Some peered in through the front windows of the inn, and a few even questioned Hugh and Tad, though it was far from clear what they were supposed to know. The two stolid stablemen just grunted in reply and went on methodically removing the team's harness. One by one, they led Fane's horses away, and when the last was gone, did not return. Rand ignored the crowd. He took a seat on the edge of the old stone foundation, gathered his cloak around him, and stared at the inn door. Gildan, Tarvalan. The very names were strange and exciting. They were places he knew only from peddler's news and tales told by merchants' guards. Ai Sedai, and wars and false dragons. Those were the stuff of stories told late at night in front of the fireplace, with one candle making strange shapes on the wall and the wind howling against the shutters. On the whole, he believed he would rather have blizzards and wolves. Still, it must be different out there, beyond the two rivers. Like living in the middle of a gleeman's tale. An adventure. One long adventure. A whole lifetime of it. Slowly, the villagers dispersed, still muttering and shaking their heads. Whitconger paused to stare into the now-abandoned wagon, as though he might find another peddler hidden inside. Finally, only a few of the younger folk were left. Matt and Perrin drifted over to where Rand sat. I don't see how the Gleeman could beat this, Matt said excitedly. I wonder if we might get to see this false dragon. Perrin shook his shaggy head. I don't want to see him. Somewhere else, maybe, but not in the two rivers. Not if it means war. Not if it means I to die here, either, Rand added. Or have you forgotten who caused the breaking? The dragon may have started it, but it was I Sedai who actually broke the world. I heard a story once, Matt said slowly, from a wool buyer's guard. He said the dragon would be reborn in mankind's greatest hour of need and save us all. Well, he was a fool if he believed that, Perrin said firmly, and you were a fool to listen. He did not sound angry. He was slow to anger, but he sometimes got exasperated with Matt's quicksilver fancies and there was a touch of that in his voice. I suppose he claimed we'd all live in a new age of legends afterwards, too. I didn't say I believed it, Matt protested. I just heard it. Nynaeve did, too, and I thought she was going to skin me and the guard both. He said, the guard did, that a lot of people do believe, only they're afraid to say so, afraid of the eyes to die, or the children of the light. He wouldn't say any more after Nynaeve lit into us. She told the merchant... And he said it was the guard's last trip with him. A good thing, too, Perrin said. The dragon going to save us? Sounds like Copland talked to me. What kind of need would be great enough that we'd want the dragon to save us from it? Rand mused. As well ask for help from the Dark One. He didn't say, Matt replied uncomfortably. And he didn't mention any New Age of Legends. He said the world would be torn apart by the dragon's coming. That would surely save us, Baron said dryly. Another breaking. Burn me, Matt growled. I'm only telling you what the guard said. Perrin shook his head. I just hope the Aes Sedai and this dragon, false or not, stay where they are. Maybe that way, the two rivers will be spared. You think they're really dark friends? Matt was frowning thoughtfully. Who? Rand asked. Aes Sedai. Rand glanced at Perrin, who shrugged. The stories, he began slowly, but Matt cut him off. Not all the stories say they serve the Dark One, Rand. Like Matt, Rand said. They caused the breaking. What more do you want? I suppose. Matt sighed, but the next moment he was grinning again. Old Billy Conger says they don't exist. I said I. Dark friends. Says they're just stories. He says he doesn't believe in the Dark One either. Perrin snorted. Copland talk from a conger. What else can you expect? Oh, Billy named the Dark One. I'll bet you didn't know that. Light, Rand breathed. Matt's grin broadened. It was last spring, just before the cutworm got into his fields and nobody else's. Right before everybody in his house came down with yellow eye fever. I heard him do it. He still says he doesn't believe it. But whenever I ask him to name the Dark One now, he throws something at me. You're just stupid enough to do that, aren't you, Matrim Coffin? Nynaeve Almira stepped into their huddle, 
The dark braid pulled over her shoulder, almost bristling with anger. Rand scrambled to his feet. Slender and barely taller than Matt's shoulder, at the moment the wisdom seemed taller than any of them, and it did not matter that she was young and pretty. I suspected something of the sort about Billy Conger at the time, but I thought you at least had more sense than to try taunting him into such a thing. You may be old enough to be married, Matt from Cawthon, but in truth, you shouldn't be off your mother's apron strings. The next thing, you'll be naming the Dark One yourself. No wisdom, Matt protested, looking as if he would rather be anywhere else than there. It was old Bill... I mean, Master Conger, not me. Blood and ashes, I... Watch your tongue, Matrim. Rand stood up straighter, though her glare was not directed at him. Perrin looked equally abashed. Later, one or another of them would almost certainly complain about being scolded by a woman not all that much older than themselves. Someone always did, after one of Nynaeve's scoldings, if never in her hearing. But the gap in ages always seemed more than wide enough when face to face with her especially if she was angry. The stick in her hand was thick at one end and a slender switch at the other, and she was liable to give a flail to anybody she thought was acting the fool. Head or hands or legs, no matter their age or position. The wisdom so held his attention that at first Rand failed to see she was not alone. When he realized his mistake, he began to think about leaving no matter what Nynaeve would say or do later. Egwene stood a few paces from the wisdom, watching intently. Of a height with Nynaeve, and with the same dark coloring, she could at that moment have been a reflection of Nynaeve's mood. Arms crossed beneath her breasts, mouth tight with disapproval. The hood of her soft gray cloak shaded her face, and her big brown eyes held no laughter now. If there was any fairness, he thought that being two years older than her should give him some advantage, but that was not the way of it. At the best of times, he was never very nimble with his tongue when talking to any of the village girls, not like Perrin. But whenever Egwene gave him that intent look, with her eyes as wide as they would go, as if every last ounce of her attention was on him, he just could not seem to make the words go where he wanted. Perhaps he could get away as soon as Nynaeve finished. But he knew he would not, even if he did not understand why. If you are done staring like a moonstruck lamb, Rand Althor, Nynaeve said, Perhaps you can tell me why you are talking about something even you three great bull calves ought to have sense enough to keep out of your mouths. Rand gave a start and pulled his eyes away from Egwene. She had grown a disconcerting smile when the wisdom began speaking. Nynaeve's voice was tart, but she had the beginnings of a knowing smile on her face too, until Matt laughed aloud. The wisdom's smile vanished, and the look she gave Matt cut his laughter off in a strangled croak. Well, Rand... Nynaeve said. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Egwene still smiling. What does she think is so funny? It was natural enough to talk of it, Wisdom, he said hurriedly. The peddler, Padan Fane, ah, uh, Master Fane, brought news of a false dragon in Gildan, and a war, and the eyes Sedai. The council thought it was important enough to talk to him. What else will we be talking about? Nynaeve shook her head. So that's why the peddler's wagon stands abandoned. I heard people rushing to meet it, but I couldn't leave Mistress Aelin till her fever broke. The council is questioning the peddler about what's happening in Gildan, are they? If I know them, they are asking all the wrong questions, and none of the right ones. It will take the women's circle to find out anything useful. Settling her cloak firmly on her shoulders, she disappeared into the inn. Egwene did not follow the wisdom. As the inn door closed behind Nynaeve, the younger woman came to stand in front of Rand. The frowns were gone from her face, but her unblinking stare made him uneasy. He looked to his friends, but they moved away, grinning broadly as they abandoned him. You shouldn't let Matt get you mixed up in his foolishness, Rand, Egwene said, as solemn as a wisdom herself. Then abruptly she giggled. I haven't seen you look like that since Sen Bui caught you and Matt up in his apple trees when you were ten. He shifted his feet and glanced at his friends. They stood not far away, Matt gesturing excitedly as he talked. Will you dance with me tomorrow? That was not what he had meant to say. He did want to dance with her, but at the same time he wanted nothing so little as the uncomfortable way he was sure to feel while he was with her. The way he felt right then. The corners of her mouth quirked up in a small smile. In the afternoon, she said. I will be busy in the morning. 
From the others came Perrin's exclamation. A gleeman! Egwene turned toward them, but Rand put a hand on her arm. Busy? How? Despite the chill, she pushed back the hood of her cloak and with apparent casualness, pulled her hair forward over her shoulder. The last time he had seen her, her hair had hung in dark waves below her shoulders, with only a red ribbon keeping it back from her face. Now it was worked into a long braid. He stared at that braid as if it were a viper, then stole a glance at the spring pole, standing alone on the green now, ready for tomorrow. In the morning, unmarried women of marriageable age would dance the pole. He swallowed hard. Somehow, it had never occurred to him that she would reach marriageable age at the same time that he did. Just because someone is old enough to marry, he muttered, doesn't mean they should. Not right away. Of course not. Or ever, for that matter. Rand blinked. Ever? A wisdom almost never marries. Nynaeve has been teaching me, you know. She says I have a talent, that I can learn to listen to the wind. Nynaeve says not all wisdoms can, even if they say they do. Wisdom, he hooted. He failed to notice the dangerous glint in her eye. Nynaeve will be wisdom here for another fifty years at least. Probably more. Are you going to spend the rest of your life as her apprentice? There are other villages, she replied heatedly. Nynaeve says the villages north of Tarn always choose a wisdom from away. They think it stops her from having favorites among the village folk. His amusement melted as fast as it had come. Outside the two rivers? I'd never see you again. And you wouldn't like that? You have not given any sign lately that you'd care one way or another. No one ever leaves the two rivers, he went on. Maybe somebody from Tarn Ferry, but they're all strange anyway. Hardly like two rivers folk at all. Egwene gave an exasperated sigh. Well, maybe I'm strange too. Maybe I want to see some of the places I hear about in the stories. Have you ever thought of that? Of course I have. I daydream sometimes, but I know the difference between daydreams and what's real. And I do not, she said furiously, and promptly turned her back on him. That wasn't what I meant. I was talking about me. Egwene? She jerked her cloak around her, a wall to shut him off, and stiffly walked a few paces away. He rubbed his head in frustration. How to explain? This was not the first time she had squeezed meanings from his words that he never knew were in them. In her present mood, a misstep would only make matters worse, and he was fairly sure that nearly anything he said would be a misstep. Matt and Perrin came back then. Egwene ignored their coming. They looked at her hesitantly, then crowded close to Rand. Moraine gave Perrin a coin too, Matt said. Just like ours. He paused before adding. And he saw the rider. Where? Rand demanded. When? Did anybody else see him? Did you tell anyone? Perrin raised broad hands in a slowing gesture. One question at a time. I saw him on the edge of the village, watching the smithy. Just at twilight yesterday. Gave me the shivers, he did. I told Master Luhan, only nobody was there when he looked. He said I was seeing shadows. But he carried his biggest hammer around with him while we were banking the forge fire and putting the tools up. He's never done that before. So he believed you, Rand said, but Perrin shrugged. I don't know. I asked him why he was carrying the hammer if all I saw was shadows, and he said something about wolves getting bold enough to come into the village. Maybe he thought that's what I saw, but he ought to know I can tell the difference between a wolf and a man on horseback, even at dusk. I know what I saw, and nobody is going to make me believe different. I believe you, Rand said. Remember, I saw him too. Perrin gave a satisfied grunt, as if he had not been sure of that. What are you talking about? Egwene demanded suddenly. Rand suddenly wished he had spoken more quietly. He would have, if he had realized she was listening. Matt and Perrin, grinning like fools, fell all over themselves telling her of their encounters with the black-cloaked rider. But Rand kept silent. He was sure he knew what she would say when they were done. Nynaeve was right, Egwene announced to the sky when the two youths fell silent. None of you is ready to be off leading strings. People do ride horses, you know. That doesn't make them monsters out of a gleeman's tail. Rand nodded to himself, 
It was just as he thought. She rounded on him. And you've been spreading these tales. Sometimes you have no sense, Randall Thor. The winter has been frightening enough without you going about scaring the children. Rand gave a sour grimace. I haven't spread anything, Egwene. But I saw what I saw, and it was no farmer out looking for a strayed cow. Egwene drew a deep breath and opened her mouth. But whatever she had been going to say vanished as the door of the inn opened, and a man with shaggy white hair came hurrying out as if pursued. <laughs>